Good afternoon. Uh, this is the afternoon uh, meeting for the Vermont House Human Services on uh, January, Friday, January 19th. And the first part of our uh, committee meeting, we are continuing a discussion that, that we've um, had over the past <laughs> two weeks on the goals um, or principles that will frame um, our, our deliberations, that we hope to frame our deliberations this, uh, this year. And when we finish that at quarter of two, we will be continuing the, um, the testimony that we had this morning in terms of the COVID-19 response, what we've learned and maybe what we need to think about for the future as it relates to um, uh, older Vermonters. Uh, Julie, if you would put the uh, draft um, principles up again the guiding principles. Um, thank you, Julie. They are being shared and we can see them as can folks who are listening or reviewing it later. Um, so I am looking for some feedback. Um, uh, uh, Topper, um, Topper spoke before and as did uh, both um, Taylor and uh, Teresa, and I didn't know, um, I was waiting to see if anyone else in the committee had uh, comments or questions. And I have to apologize. Um, um, I don't see, I'm not seeing hands. Um, Julie, could you make me a, oh, um, Representative Rosenquist and then um, Representative Redmond. Thank you. I, I continue to have a problem with uh, issues instead of problems. The issues can be either positive or negative. And if it's positive, we don't want to prevent it. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't quite understand why we change that because a problem is a problem and that's what we're working to prevent or address through affordable and effective service and supports. So I just, uh, just my feeling, I just think issues is the wrong word. Um, I appreciate your, your consistency, Carl. Um, and uh, um, I believe, and I would then look to anyone on the, who was drafting it, or something else to say. We were in using that word, we were actually on, um, for some people, it was very important, um, makes sense to me actually too, to have a more neutral um, use of language because in fact, something that we might want to work on is um, how to improve something, um, how to prevent something becoming a problem. So putting something in place. So I believe that that may have been um, part of the um, thought in terms of that. Um, I see a bunch of hands. Um, my, my problem there is that it says prevent it. So if it's an issue that we'd like to put forward, it's saying prevent it, so. Okay, thank you. Um, Dane. Thank you, uh, Anne. I have a suggestion uh, okay. for this. Um, what if it was ensuring that issues are addressed through affordable, preventative, and effective services and supports? So you add preventative as a way that you address issues rather than something that you prevent. Yeah, that sounds, sounds better to me. Okay. I'm not, you know, I don't want to prevent... Um, us dragging this thing out for a long time. I just brought it up. It was no, my I, desire, but I, I'm happy with uh, the consensus of the of the committee. Carl, I love having you on committee. Um, we have a suggestion, and we can talk about that and think about that. And but right now, why don't we just get everyone's feedback? Um, Mary Beth, then James, then Jessica. I, I really um, think this guiding principles document is wonderful. I think it's well uh, stated. 
Um, I like Dane's suggested change in language for that one particular bullet. Um, I have two really minor uh, punctuation grammatical things. Um, just in the very first bolded paragraph, I would add a comma after public health, just because you have several ands there. And I think it just makes it clear that social and economic security goes together. Um, and then my only other suggestion would be the, in the last bullet, um, since you're talking about Vermonters as a collective in plural, I would um, change level to level to, that they attain their highest levels of independence. Um, other than that, I think it's wonderfully done and thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary Beth. Um, could I just ask a question of Mary Beth? Certainly, Tapper. Um, I, I didn't know what you meant by the, the first uh, um, statement that you made about the comma behind public health and then, uh, and then you said something and I didn't quite get it. Sure, sure, happy to reiterate. Um, so in the very first paragraph, at the, yeah. um, at the end of the last sentence, yeah. it says, um, consider matters relating to human services, comma, public health and social and economic security. And I'm suggesting that a comma be added after public health um, so that you wouldn't think it's public health and social goes together. Oh, well, I, just... I see what you mean, yep, 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 yep. Okay. okay. Yep. And no, then I do you want me to, do you understand yeah, this? Yeah. The, and then the second um, change is again, extremely minor. It's the final bullet um, and where it talks about ensuring all Vermonters have equitable, equitable access to services and supports that enable them to attain their mm -hmm. highest levels, levels of levels, independence. Yeah. I yeah. got it, I got it. Okay, thanks Mary Beth. You're welcome. Okay, I believe it was James and then Jessica. Um, okay, I'm um, sorry. I, on this new version, I can't find the, the mute button, but can you hear me? <laughs> yes, yes, we can. Uh, I actually was going to just mention the comma in the first uh, thing, and then uh, it kind of semi agree with Carl about the uh, issues. You don't want to prevent something positive, but it does say or, so I guess you'd have to really think hard about that one. Um, just um, you don't want to prevent anything positive, but um, I think I think it'll be okay. Okay, um, and um, how are you in terms of, of the suggested um, editing change from uh, Dane? Um, I think it's a little different. I still think that when the word preventing prevent is in there uh, with anything that could be positive, which is issues, um, is still an issue, but it's not that big an issue. We know what it means, uh, and so that's what really matters. Um, you know, I'm, I don't have a big, I don't have, it's not a huge problem. Okay. Thank you, James. Um, and Jessica. Thank you. I just um, wanted to say, first of all, love it. I really like the preamble at the beginning. I think that um, that just makes it so much stronger overall. And um, I'm good with Dane's um, suggestion of you know changing ensuring that um, issues are addressed through affordable preventable is that the and effective services and supports is that right I don't know it was something close to that and I liked it so I just wanted to say that thanks okay. um, does anyone else have anything to add or any comment? I would just say that um, I like Dane's change. Okay. Otherwise, I think it looks great. Okay. Dane may have to repeat that um, <laughs> um, because we all have our own views. Um, Topper. And then Has Dane. everybody talked now, Madam Chair? I, um, um, uh, no, D uh, Dan has not spoken. Okay, yet. I'll wait till everyone's done. Okay. 
Uh, and Madam Chair, I'm, I'm, uh, I've got my own document here. I'm tracking the changes on. So I have Dane's language. And do you have the... Um, and comma? the punctuation additions. And the punctuation yes. additions. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Dan, if you would go, then Topper would like to go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what about adverse issues are um, prevented? So ensuring that adverse issues are prevented and addressed um, through affordable, effective supports and services. Just throwing that out there. Thank you. Thank you. And Topper, everyone has gone now, I believe, unless um, uh, Taylor and Teresa right now. Um, go ahead, Topper. Okay, I, I would like to bring up my, my public health uh, piece again about COVID uh, vaccines and testing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's extremely important. Um, it is our responsibility. And I think for the, at least the first year of this biennium, we're gonna be uh, involved in this in a big way. Um, so I think that we should have something in there um, saying that we're gonna ensure that these vaccines are uh, distributed safely, equitably, in a timely manner, and that the testing um, is, is uh, for the virus is, is carried out in a, uh, a manner that uh, provides uh, to the maximum and equitable access, maximum and equitable access uh, for all the monitors. Mm -hmm. I, I just really think that we're responsible for public health. This is a big public health issue. And I think for at least the first year, we should have something in there that talks about us being involved with it. Thank you, Topper. Um, okay. um, and it's clear you feel very, you, it's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, Jessica, Jessica. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Topper. I. Um, I'm sorry, um, Representative. No, I, I think we're allowed to be. Um, for, we can be oh, however okay. we want to, um, <laughs> but I believe I believe the um, the the thing is use the language we want to. I mean, the names we want that we prefer in our informal discussions. Okay, I um I get what you're saying, and I totally understand how important vaccines are and how much a huge part of public health that is, and public health falls. Um, within our jurisdiction. Here's my problem is that how can we say that we're going to ensure all of those things with vaccines when we know so clearly that this whole thing is so complicated. Everything I listen to, not only from my, in my household because of my husband being the head of the healthcare system, but also the um, what the governor says, and then what you hear from um, the physician that we hear from all the time. I can't think of his name right now, but for, for Couchy or for, you know who I mean, um, and so many others that for us to really go out there and say we're going to ensure that there is going to you know that everything's going to go perfectly smooth and that we're I'm just really worried about that. I feel that um, that we can't really promise that we can certainly hope for that. We can um, try and li listen to, you know, folks who, someone like um, the commissioner of health, have him come and keep us updated. We could ensure that we would, we would listen and be updated, but to ensure that we would make it, I'm not sure it's ours to ensure. Anyhow, that's just my feeling, sorry. Okay, in, in terms of responding, uh, um, Topper, Topper. Yes. Um, I think it's important. Um, we've all heard you. We've heard you twice. Okay. All right. And now it is time for the rest of the committee members to respond to um, okay. your suggestion. And Good. Carl, Carl has his hand up. Thank you. I, I, returning back to what we talked about in the beginning of all this, and that was that these are supposed to be overarching principles. 
and not terribly specific to a, a specific issue. And I think that's what we're getting into here. We're getting into a very specific area. That's very important. I'm not uh, getting away from that. But I don't think it believe, belongs in our overarching principles and gui our guiding principles. So I, I would be, not be uh, encouraging its introduction into these guiding principles. Thank you, Carl. Um, Teresa. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I, I, I um, personally feel like promoting public health for all Vermonters is the broad category under which that falls. And we certainly are going to be keeping an eye out for that. And I think everybody on our committee feels like it's important. And we, um, it's, I'm going to, I'm going to quote coach on this. He says, um, oh, if we ask the right questions, all means all and trying to, um, uh, you know, make sure that all Vermonters have access to the things that Topper was talking about um, is really important. And we are all going to be keeping an eye out on that um, under the first bullet. So I agree 100% with Topper that it's important. Um, and I, I feel like it's too specific to include in, in these guiding principles myself. Thank you. Um... Would anyone else like to uh, comment? Um, I think that, um, I guess I would ask um, folks to think about how they would like to comment. This is very important to Topper. And um, if the majority of the committee agrees with Topper, then we will, you know, think about that. If the majority of the committee um, does not, um, agree with putting it in the guiding principles, then um, we would not. Uh, Taylor. Uh, thank you, Anne. I will reiterate what others have put forward and just saying that I agree with Topper in the respect of really promoting public health and making sure that vaccines and testing are going out in an equitable way. Um, but don't feel like it should go into our guiding principles again because of the broadness that we are hoping for here and instead would pose a question around is there, if there is agreement across the committee around an equitable release, is there a statement that could be made on behalf of the committee that would uh, move to that realm? Or is there another action that can be taken? This is coming from the new legislator who is um, just figuring out how we can still push forward on this and, and really honor what Topper was bringing forward while also not um, muddying our guiding principles. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure that that is, that is clearly something that um, an issue that is not only, <clears throat> not only an issue for us, <clears throat> it's an issue on some level that, that, but you know, who knows that potentially government operations or appropriations or healthcare or, you know, all might want to have, all may be engaged in this through different kinds of ways. Um, I think I have heard from almost everybody um, in general, um, and in fact, the governor commented on that in his press conference today, that um, the legislature has put front and center um, dealing with um, uh, the pandemic and responding to the pandemic. Um, okay, and um, Dane, and then James. Thank you, Anne. Um, I think I'll echo what a lot of uh, other folks have said as far as while COVID-19 response is um, a huge issue for us right now and critical, um, I kind of like the idea that we can put promoting public health and that it includes that and that two years from now, we can look back at this document and it doesn't need to be revised because that, that you know, circumstances have changed. Um, Another thing I want to say, and I'm a, I'm a relentless wordsmither, so feel free to stop me at any point. <laughs> but, um, going back to the, the other uh, draft that I offered earlier on the fourth bullet, um, 
I wanted to offer another version where we just strike out um, are prevented. So ensuring that issues are addressed through affordable and effective services and supports. Because I think preventative uh, you know, strategies are really uh, included in affordable and effective services and supports. And I think that if we included preventative later, it would somehow assume that everything was something mm -hmm. we wanted to prevent. So it doesn't quite work as well. Anyway, um, I'll stop there. Okay. No, that's that, I mean, that, that makes sense to me, but we'll um, go. Uh, James. Uh, first, I want to thank Dane for that one. That's the one I wanted. Um, that is the best suggestion ever. Uh, you're my hero. Uh, second, uh, these are supposed to be, um, by their definition, uh, broad, open. So there are a lot of things that are going to be specifically in, uh, important to us as individuals and as a group. But it's supposed to be uh, an overarching uh, an umbrella, if you will, that we can conduct our business underneath. And so I, I think it should be kept that way. Okay. Uh, does anyone else want to say anything? Um, I believe, um, Topper, that you have uh, um, heard from the majority of the committee and I would be uh, I would be joining them in both appreciating and thanking you for your um, relentless advocacy for um, the importance of uh, the legislature and um, this committee in particular focusing on um, testing and being brought up to keeping that um, both testing and vaccines, keeping that on our radar and keeping um, keeping the administration um, focused on that, which they are. Um, I do agree um, with, uh, I'm going to say I agree with Carl because sometimes Carl and I don't always agree. <laughs> um, but um, uh, and, um, that these are, these are the idea years ago when we started doing principles was to uh, have some broad um, concepts that would uh, frame our work no matter what came up, no matter what um, topic came up to us, but that these principles would frame um, whether or not we took them up and then how we made our decisions. Um, not that we'd always make the same decisions, but we would um, do it that way. Um, so, um, Madam Chair? Yes. Um, I would like to thank the committee for um, having this conversation. And um, I, uh, I, I will agree that we drop it and uh, we just do our due diligence in terms of uh, what we're supposed to do under the public health mandate that we have. But I wanna tell all the members of the committee how much I appreciate this free flowing conversation. And um, I think we should just drop it at that because we got some great uh, principles to go by. Thank you. Thanks, Topper. And, You're welcome. I, be and I believe that Carl has um, a comment he wants to make. Just I wanted to say that I agree with, with Dane's uh, last uh, change to bullet four. I think that really accomplishes a lot of the issues that some of us had. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any? Um, thank you, Carl. Um, I've heard a couple of people. I've heard you. I've heard um, uh, James. I just want to give space for if anyone um, has strong concerns with um, taking that up uh, with what was what Dane suggested. And hearing none, um, as someone else, oh, 
Topper. I, uh, I can't hear you, Topper. Are we ready to make a motion? We are ready to make a motion. I would move that we adopt the guiding principles with the changes that were made today. Um, thank you, Topper. And do those changes include take um, the last one that Dane suggested around taking out are prevented? Yes. Okay. So Topper has made a motion. Oh, goody. Um, I have to like make you all broad now. Um, I'll second that. Okay. And it is seconded by um, Jessica. Um, it's not going on. Um, would people please raise their hand? Um, all those in favor of the um, of this, please raise your hand. All those opposed? Okay. Well, thank you, committee. I think we have done um, what sounds, I mean, I appreciate, and I think it's good that we have this frame, and this will be on our committee web page um, under the. Um, I think there's an uh, an other category, and there's um, um, there is the uh, organizational chart of, of AHS, and um, this will be underneath that, so it'll be with easy access not only to us but to the public um, in terms of that. Um, Mary Beth. Just quick and hearty kudos to our new members who stepped up and really helped us with this. Very grateful. Very, very grateful. And um, yes. And Dane, I don't know if you um, sort of heard or saw, people are very excited that there's a wordsmith um, in our midst. Uh, so um, thank you. Um, it is, it is quarter of uh, two, and so we're going to um, go to the second sort of half of our um, meeting this morning or this afternoon, and we have uh, four people who are going to, um, Gail Zatz, Sue Chase, um, uh, Janet Munt, Janet, sorry, not Janet Munt, um, Janet, um, Janet Hunt and Molly Dugan, who are going to um, speak from the community uh, perspective. Um, and I want to apologize to the four of you. Um, I have been um, unexpectedly called away for about 20 minutes. Um, so uh, um, Representative Wood will be running the committee and what I miss, I promise I will um, look on uh, on YouTube and hopefully I will be back before we're completely um, gone. Um, so I will see you all later. Uh, Representative Wood, if you would um, take over, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, I think that when uh, we left, uh, Gail was gonna start us off. So um, welcome Gail on behalf of the area uh, of the um, I was gonna say area agencies on aging, that's not right, it's the adult day programs. And Sue, it's so nice to see you here again. It's great to see you too, Teresa. So Hi, uh, uh, well, why don't you swing us off, Gail? Okay, actually we do represent the AAAs, um, but we're actually here, I'm here to testify on behalf of uh, uh, the adult day programs. Um, so I'm Gail Zatz and I work with Zatz and Renfrew Consulting. Uh, Virginia Renfrew and I have worked for about 16 years with the Vermont Association of Adult Day Services. And it's nice to see you all and uh, meet some of the new members. And uh, you're probably more familiar with working with Virginia over the years. Um, and Sue is here uh, also to testify. And before I go on, Sue, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Sue Chase. Uh, I'm with Care Partners Adult Day Center up in St. Albans. Um, and very pleased to be here. And uh, it's actually been a few years since I've testified in front of House Human Services. So it sort of feels like uh, old home week, <laughs> though through Zoom. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, provide a brief overview um, of the adult day programs and how actions of the legislature uh, over the past uh, 10 months have kept the programs afloat. And, um, and I say brief because Commissioner 
uh, Hutt actually did almost all of my testimony. <laughs> so um, she gave a really good overview. Um, so I'll just highlight a few things. Um, so there are currently 10 programs down from 13 from before the pandemic began. And Sue's gonna talk a little bit more about that, um, which provide community-based non-residential support to people who mostly have physical or cognitive impairments. Um, the existence of the adult day programs allows people to age at home. Um, it redu reduces nursing home admissions, which saves the state money through Medicaid as uh, the majority of our participants um, use some form of Medicaid. Uh, so people come during the day and uh, they get social and health services, uh, nutritious meals, social activities. Um, but in addition to the services that are provided to the participants, the uh, caregivers and family members also get some respite uh, support and education. Um, the 10 programs that are existing, I, I thought I would mention them if some of them are in your areas. So there's the Bennington Project Independence in Bennington, Care Partners in St. Albans, Elderly Services in Middlebury, The Gathering Place in Brattleboro, Gifford Adult Day in Randolph, Lamoille Day Health Services in Morrisville, The Meeting Place in Newport, Riverside Life and Richmond Center in Lindenville, Scotland House in Queechee, and UVM Home Health and Hospice Adult Day Program in Burlington. And um, every year we encourage the adult day programs to reach out to legislators to introduce them to their programs in, in their areas. And we also encourage you all, if there are any programs, or any of these programs are in your area, uh, to reach out and learn a little bit more about the programs. Um, so over the past 10 months, uh, funding support from the state and other sources have helped uh, to keep the programs remain viable while they've been closed. And for the most part, they've all been closed since March 2020, uh, March 2020. Um, the reason I say for the most part is because they are providing some remote services. And uh, Sue is gonna talk about the um, Adult Day Without Walls program that uh, she and others have helped to create within uh, VADS, which is the acronym for the association. Um, without the help of this funding, then the programs would not have been able to survive. So we're currently existing quarter by quarter. So, excuse me, let me turn that off. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so in the last quarter of FY 2020, um, the programs have survived, had survived because of Medicaid retainer payments from DIVA PPP loans, EIDL loans, um, other uh, donations um, from, uh, uh, from um, people who give the money periodically from time to time. So, um, so after that uh, last quarter in FY 2020, thanks to the members of this committee and your colleagues in the House and the Senate last session, we were able to access CRF uh, monies for the first quarter of FY 2021 to the tune of $2.45 million. In uh, the second quarter of FY 2021, um, the CRF appropriation was $2 million. Of that $2 million, as the commissioner stated, there uh, are some monies that were unused, about $160,000. So right now we are working with Dale to try to figure out how to redistribute that 160 um, throughout the programs. And uh, that's, that's a work in progress right now. Um, so now that brings us to the current third quarter of FY 2021. Um, so uh, really as of now, we do not have any money to speak of that is coming in. So we're working on the exact numbers, but we estimate that we will need approximately $1.9 million for this quarter that we are in right now. And the programs have told us that without more financial help, they are going to anticipate more programs permanently closing. So we are trying to do whatever we can to try to avoid that given both the services that we provide to the participants and uh, the assistance that we provide to their caregivers and family members. Um, not to mention the strain that that will potentially put on the nursing home system um, if there uh, are not services like ours that uh, can help them either through the pandemic and after the pandemic. 
So with that, I will turn it over to Sue. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, so in terms of uh, the impact of COVID for Adult Day that as uh, Gail had mentioned, there were 13 Adult Day providers um, at the beginning of the, the pandemic, um, the state um, mandated that we close um, in mid in mid March, um, and um, as uh, Commissioner Hutt mentioned, that adult days are fee for service. So we only receive funding for people physically being at our programs, um, and so that um, you know, without having any source of revenue coming in, our financial vi uh, viability was really in question and we really do appreciate the support that we've gotten from Dale, the support we've gotten from the legislature. Um, and unfortunately there have been two, three programs total that have closed uh, because it was, they were not, it was just not financially viable for them to stay open. So right uh, early on in the pandemic, um, uh, InterAge in Rutland um, announced that they would be permanently closing and uh, Barry Project Independence also um, uh, decided that they needed to close, um, which was a huge concern for people in the community because these were, were you know, definitely um, uh, important programs in in those in those areas, um, and and I will say that um, what Adult Day and and as I mentioned earlier, I have testified through the years um, uh, at the legislature that Adult Days are lean organizations. There's not a lot of of wiggle room in that. And so that um, many adult days have struggled through the years. And, and so that in some ways, this was just kind of, there wasn't any pathway in terms of kind of moving moving forward. The um, latest program that uh, decided that they were not gonna be able to reopen was Oxbow Senior Independent Living um, in Newberry. Um, and they uh, permanently closed the end of, end of September um, and so that, you know, it's been, it's been hard and the rest of us are really sort of struggling to kind of keep things, keep things going. Um, in late September, the state issued guidance, uh, reopening guidance. Um, and so that most of the adult days were working towards reopening, um, you know, bringing things together to kind of be able to safely serve people um, at their programs. A couple of us did actually open our doors again to then um, in care partners uh, situation, we were open seven days and then we got notice, notice from the state that because of the, the surge, we were gonna need to close, close again. Um, so right now we have all pivoted back to the virtual services that we've been providing now um, since the beginning of the, the pandemic. Um, and so that we've been we've been very concerned from the get-go around and, and we and I and you've heard this from other people today, the impact of social isolation um, for for all of us, uh, but especially for uh, older older adults. Um, and we've been concerned about loneliness, depression, um, that uh, adult days provide um, health monitoring services and so the, the inability to kind of be able to check people who uh, were diabetics, their feet, or to be monitoring um, blood saturation levels for people that have uh, respiratory illnesses. Those have been really concerns that we've, we've had. Um, and so that we, as a result of that, have have um, created Adult Day Without Walls um, that protects, nurtures, and supports Adult Day participants um, and their families and caregivers during during the pandemic. And and most Adult Day programs are providing telehealth, uh, telephonic uh, companionship calls, as Commissioner Hutt um, described, and then also activity-based acti um, uh, services such as Zoom activities, track groups groups. Um, actually, um, care partner staff just headed off to deliver 45 activity packets that we do about every three weeks for our participant. It includes kind of pencil games. You know, we may be sending yarn to somebody that needs to do yarn. Um, I'm not a huge bingo fan, but we're sending out bingo daubers and, and bingo sheets, and they love it. I mean, bingo is probably one of our most popular Zoom activities, and, and it 
really helps people stay connected. Uh, we have caregivers uh, from adult family care homes that basically set their person up in front of an iPad and they play bingo with us or they may do a virtual tour. It's really incredibly rich and, and it really makes a difference. And I, and I know I hear every day from our participants that this kind of being ability to be stay connected and, and um, you know, check in on their friends and, and, you know, learn new things and be mentally stimulated has been huge during this um, unprecedented time. Um, and in addition to providing caregiver support, um, we, our staff are doing telephone calls that uh, both to participants and their caregivers um, and, you know, we've, we've heard from caregivers, they say, you know, we are the only ones that reach out to them to see how things are going and try to support them, help them get hooked up to other services and, and, um, and, and whatnot. So it's been incredibly rich. I will say that um, a couple of adult days um, have, uh, are only able to offer limited virtual services because their employees have been deployed to other critical services within their organizations. Uh, but, you know, all of us are, are doing something to try to um, remain in touch and connected to, to our participants. Um, and that the uh, Corona Relief Funds and, and the Health Care Stabilization Funds, all of these financial support has been incredibly important to our ability to maintain these kinds of services. And our board met yesterday trying to figure out, okay, what do we do now with, with all this, um, you know, funding having, um, you know, ended um, and we are committed to, to kind of making this work for the next little bit because we don't want to lose that connection with, with people. Um, as Commissioner Hutt mentioned, Dale has worked with us in terms of trying to come up with some flexibility around funding um, and that they have created some um, opportunities where we can access companionship funds uh, through the Choice for Care program and flexible funds through Moderate Needs Group. Um, I will tell you that um, um, only a couple of adult day providers have actually worked on accessing these funds at this point in time. And they are indicating to me that this represents only about 1% of their um, you know, what has been typical operating revenue. Um, and uh, here at Care Partners, we're gearing up to start doing this in January, but already running into some roadblocks. The moderate needs group application form doesn't indicate that the money is going to be coming from the adult day pot of MNG funds. And so the case management agency is reluctant to sign off a form because the form says it's going to come out of the case management pot. Um, they have to apply for variances under the Choice for Care program. And again, the paperwork doesn't, doesn't line up with how do you make those adjustments. And the families, quite frankly, are also concerned that um, you know, sometimes these companionship dollars are what are being used to bring in caregivers and support them in their caregiving role? And are they going to lose out on some of those services because the adult day is looking to get some token reimbursement for what we're, what we're doing? So I see it as being a first step, but is definitely not an answer and is not going to be what is going to help sustain us over the next next few months. Um, and, you know, I'm very encouraged that Dale is wanting to look at um, coming up with payment reform because I think it, the day has dawned when, you know, fee-for-service hourly rates just is, are not going to uh, meet, meet our needs and meet the needs of our, of our, our participants um, either. Um, and, and equally, I, and I I'm, I'm feel very strongly about this, I think virtual services are here to stay. Um, you know, uh, I've been at Care Partners over 20 years um, and it's a numbers game. You know, we need to have a certain number of people coming at our tour program to make it financially viable. I do not believe that we're gonna be able to serve that many people at our center going forward. 
Um, and so that, you know, for people to be able to feel a part of our program and to access it, we're going to need to have a hybrid. Um, we experimented that in the seven days that we were open, that we were offering uh, simultaneous um, uh, activities here and um, uh, projecting them through Zoom for, for folks. Um, and so that we are very committed to resuming in-person services. I really see there's a, a huge role for adult day going forward. I mean, hearing that possibly nursing homes are gonna have to be closing already, you know, we're getting referrals from family members that are reluctant to place loved ones in long-term care facilities, primarily for the reason because it's difficult to visit. Um, and so that they are seeking adult day services, um, and, but we need financial support to make this all work. Thank you very much. And if I could just add uh, to something to, uh, to what I had said before, um, given that we are in uh, the third quarter now and there is essentially no more money coming in right now, Programs are at a critical stage where they need to determine whether to let staff go. Um, you know, they have they have a lot of fixed costs, rents, mortgages, maintenance, etc. And so, um, I know you're not the appropriations committees, but committee. But just to keep you in the loop, we um, have been in conversation with uh, Senator Kitchell, uh, talking about the healthcare stabilization fund that still has some money left over, and so. We're trying to access some of those funds for the immediate need right now uh, before we move into budget adjustment and uh, uh, to help us through the balance of this fiscal year. I see Representative Pugh has returned, so I'll turn it back to you. Oh, and I was going to have you finish out um, uh, these folks. Um, are I, there... I do have a question, Representative okay. Pugh, if you would like. <laughs> I, I would, thank you. Um, so, uh, Gail, that is one of the questions that I had for you and Sue. Uh, it, you, you mentioned approximately 1.9 million, and I was looking at the, the time frame. That's for the this third quarter of um, fiscal year 2021. What, um, I believe that you've conveyed a sense of urgency about that. What is, what is the time frame under which you would need to receive that for us to prevent any further closures of adult day programs? That's a good question. I'm actually in the process of gathering information from all the programs as to how imminently uh, or how imminent it is that they would close without receiving any further funds. Now, of course, there is the opportunity to apply for the new PPP loans and possibly some other federal uh, assistance, but that is going to take a while. And, um, and waiting for budget adjustment is going to take a while, which is why we are trying to access the healthcare stabilization fund uh, monies if possible, because that could be immediate. Um, I talked with uh, one program who said that they have about three months, months of reserves, but I, I don't think all of the programs have that much money in reserve. And then, um, Sue, if you, if you could give us some sense of, you're able to bill for some of what you're, uh, you know, for some money that you have in your allocation. So is that like 25% of that, 50% of that? What's, what's the gap like for an individual program? And then um, on the people side of things, have you uh, seen in your program people who, um, were receiving supports in the community and then had to be, um, were admitted to a, a uh, skilled nursing facility or other long-term care facility because of the lack of support um, in that, you know, during this time. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so um, I have done a little bit of an analysis around kind of what the revenue might look like for us, to, or I'll frame it a slightly different way. We presently have 55 people that I'm, I'm saying that are sort of on our rolls, so to speak, and uh, 25 of them are on the Choice for Care program, which includes this companionship funding. 
Seven of those people are in adult family care homes. We cannot use companionship dollars for those people. We have, there's no revenue source for seven of those people. Um, Dale is very specific. We have to be talking to the participant, not the family member. We have one person whose dementia is advanced enough that she is unable to communicate. Mm -hmm. So we're down to 17 people there. Um, and then uh, we have nine people on the moderate needs group program that the state is indicating we could be accessing flex funds for. Um, and so com we come up with 25 people um, and we're gonna be able to bill maybe an hour or two a week mm -hmm. for each of those people. Um, so it's not, I, I know um, uh, Heather Filanu from UVM Home Health and Hospice had said that in their billing, they've been um, generating maybe $300, $400 a month. That's it. It's very little. Um, and in terms of, we, here at Care Partners, we've been really pretty fortunate. Um, we only, um, we've had some people that have gone into uh, for short-term nursing home stay. Uh, we only have actually one participant who um, has been placed in a nursing home. And I would not say that that would, it was due to COVID. I think there were other other um, factors that are that are there, but definitely um, uh, there are. I mean, to be honest with you, I think some some families and some people are seeking placement, but there's a lot of facilities are not taking new new admissions, um, and so they are really just trying to hang in there and make this this all work. Work. Okay. Thank you very much. Do uh, any committee members have any questions for? Uh, around adult day services for either of the witnesses. Thank you Thanks. both very much. And uh, Gail? Uh, I, I just wanted to say, kind of wish Commissioner Hutt uh, was still on because um, I just wanted to say that uh, Commissioner Hutt and uh, Megan Tierney Ward literally moved government mountains to get the CRF monies out to us in an incredibly timely manner. They recognized the, um, the, uh, the timeline that we were under the time crunch and they, they were really amazing. When the legislature appropriated that money, they turned it around and got it to us right away and worked with us uh, to you know, have it all uh, work well. Great, thank you, good to hear. Now, Madam uh, Chair, back to you. Thank you. I'm just going to highlight that it is 2.11 um, and we have two more um, witnesses and the committee is over at, well, one of the witnesses has to leave at three. The committee is um, hopefully over at three. And um, so I sort of say that to both our witnesses. I apologize in terms of the kind of talking you're going to do. Um, so, uh, Janet and then um, um, Janet and then Molly. Janet. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. Uh, I want to just uh, highlight some some areas specifically, and then talk about a couple of scenarios that our area agencies on aging um, have experienced. My name is Janet Hunt. For the record. I'm the executive director for the Vermont Association of Area Agencies on Aging. Um, and with the onset of COVID in March, our area agencies worked expediently and seamlessly to uh, maintain all of the services for older adults. Um, the staff worked at home remotely uh, and continued to uh, provide those service, services regardless there continues to be areas of concern to meet the usual needs and the increased demands due to the pandemic. So I wanna highlight um, some of our key services in my testimony today, and that's nutrition and meal services, family care caregiver supports, mental health care, and the information and services and <clears throat> care and service coordinator and case management. So with our nutrition and meal services, I'm sure you've been uh, quite aware that all of our congregate meal sites uh, closed to the public um, and shifted to the home delivered meals and um, takeout meals or uh, pickup meals. 
the meal providers are generally, <clears throat> generally seeing an increase in expenses due to the pandemic and the increases are affecting our food purchases as well as supplies. The agencies are continuing to work with providers individually to see how we can help meet their needs. Um, and the support to the meal providers has been provided through an increase in meal reimbursement rate or additional monthly funding to offset some of the increase in, in the cost of supplies. There's been an increased demand for home delivered meals, as you can imagine, throughout the state. Um, not only are we seeing an increase in the number of people who need the meal, but an increase in the number of meals per week to each client due to the lack of other in-home services. Um, and in, in addition to the regular expenses for meals, funds have been needed for emergency meals, uh, hand sanitizer for those who are delivering the meals, the food carriers, uh, money to replace equipment to help other necessary expenses with our contractors. And some contractors are needed to close when experiencing some possible COVID exposure among their staff or volunteers. We've continued to see an, a significant cost in terms of what we have contracted with providers for versus the amount of meals being served. We've continued to focus on the need and have adjusted our budgets to make sure there's adequate allowances to meet the higher demand. Uh, and some of our agencies claim indicate that we're in our fir first quarter and significantly, significantly off budget. We've had reserved some of the CARE Act funds received through the Older Americans Act as we're able to exp expend through September, um, but it will not fill the need given the demands. On to family caregiver supports. There's just not enough respite options for caregivers to the um, uh, leading to increased caregiver stress and fatigue and burnout. We've seen a number, uh, a higher number of uh, caregiver fatigue and burnout, which can lead, unfortunately, to abuse and to a neglect, uh, as well as contributing to nursing home admissions that families hadn't intended uh, to, to move forward with. Uh, the closure of the adult daycare centers has placed additional stress on families and caregivers in the home. And then moving on to mental health care or behavioral health care, we recognize an increased need in this. We believe the longer that physical distancing is in order, the greater the need will become. Uh, we anticipate that our contracted service providers may reach uh, capacity if the current trend continues where they're meeting the expected need will require increased partnerships and increased funding. Uh, some of the elder care clinician programs continue to see challenges in meeting the needs and there's been large turnover in those programs and referrals are not processed uh, in a timely manner. Our helpline, our case management and our care coordination um, have all experienced shifts in working remotely with limited in-person contact or face-to-face -face contact, except um, under uh, unusual or case-by-case, -case, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And, um, and in-person was only with regard to the warmer weather. Uh, so now with the cooler temperatures, of course, the cold temperatures were uh, not even able to, to necessarily do that. We've seen an increase in need for homemaker services and caregiver support and assisted tech to sec assisted technology and devices. Um, individuals are experiencing reduced availability of those in-home services from the local home um, health agencies due to the staff and worker shortages. Some service plans for choices for care, clients are not being filled due to the worker shortages and the choice for care regulations that only allow services from Bayada or home health have led to um, an, an inability to staff care plans, the VNA and, and Bayana. Clients are unable to switch to flexible choices because of wait lists for some and an inability to select uh, directly, self-direct for others. Um, the reduced availability in home, in home services has led unfortunately to an increase in nursing home admissions and unsafe home situations for people uh, requiring that uh, nursing home level of care. 
with fewer providers entering people's homes. This is leading to unchecked uh, worsening of home environments, uh, of health uh, and safety for individuals. There's a significant increase in self-neglect referrals leading to the need to hire additional staff to uh, specialized staff for this need. There's a significant shortage of uh, providers that go into clean homes, deep cleaning or ongoing homemaking. Again, this leads to unsafe and unsanitary conditions for individuals, increased loneliness, increased social isolation for those who've previously had regular contact with providers. Hoarding symptoms are expected to increase, leading to increased falls and worsening health conditions for individuals with hoarding disorder. So I just wanna um, wrap up a bit with just some individual scenarios that our staff from the AAAs have provided for me uh, today that I think are rather startling. And this is only you know, the tip of the iceberg. The, the home health care providers have an extensive wait list that predates October of 2019 in some areas. We currently don't have, they currently don't have the case manage, man, management capacity to take anyone off of their list. Um, they're asking for our help. Many of the clients who continue to receive care at home choose to stay at home knowing that there will be large gaps in coverage due to the shortages. People are spending hours alone. Families are putting in extra hours, shuffling their personal schedules and even leaving jobs before uh, because there aren't enough caregivers available. So not one person has had all of their approved hours covered. We have a significant number of clients that are not and have not for a long time um, been accessing all of their hours that they've had available to them because of the lack of staff available. Clients, uh, individuals tolerate it because they, will, they don't wanna move into a facility uh, even if the option was available. There's some individuals that have had to wait in nursing homes until there's staffing available to meet their needs at home. We've had several individuals where both their husband, and the, the husband and wife who are on uh, Choices for Care and together qualify for well over 80 hours uh, every couple of weeks are now only getting a couple out of hours a week. And in one of these situations, the wife who's unable to pr provide her own personal care is now having to change her husband's, um, take care of his needs. Uh, for personal care and overall safety. Another case uh, is similar, um, but the couple has cancer instead of cognitive issues and uh, don't have the physical abilities to safely perform the personal care needed for one another. We currently have a situation where <clears throat> the, the individual has recently been discharged from a nursing home uh, with choices for care, but both home health agencies are uh, are uh, unable to consistently staff uh, those, those, those folks. The individual has variance for a two person assist and one of the agencies is unable to show um, the care um, and, and can't be unable to show, uh, to show up and can't provide that uh, care for the assist. So the individual um, has been unsuccessful with finding and retaining staff and now is unable to act as a surrogate and needs a new one to try to retrain any staff or to retain any staff. Um, and there's no one to act as a surrogate. The, the individual ha now has skin breakdown. Um, she's been in her beds for days on end uh, due to staffing issues. Uh, it will not be long before she's hospitalized and readmitted to a facility if there is an open bed as she um, uh, and she's the challenge um, is for is staff for the, the pre pandemic uh, is almost impossible to staff and the individual has mentioned that she will look at taking her own life if things continue to get worse. She's connected to all her appropriate supports for both mental and physical health, but there's just a not not enough resources to support her holistically. Um, that is, as I said, uh, just a few of the scenarios that our staff are trying to work through to try to 
um, make sure that people's, people's needs are met, but um, I can provide a deeper impact uh, report for you if you need that at a later time. Thank you. Janet, thank you. <clears throat> I'm wondering if there's um, questions for Janet. Jen, I know I appreciate hearing both from you and the last part of what I heard um, from Sue, because uh, I was sort of wondering if more people were moving into nursing homes because they could not um, get the care that they need. And I hear you sort of saying they're, they can't always get there and they're just living at home with um, fewer supports. It's a, what I hear is a mixed um it is mixed. There are, I definitely have heard that because families or spouses are not able to take care of their loved one anymore, they, uh, their own, or the adult day programs are closed uh, and they cannot get uh, someone into their home. They have to resort to a nursing home admission, which was not their choice. Uh, so that's what I hear more often than not. Thank you. Wonderful get some, we might want to try to get some data on that rather than but all yes. of us sort of doing it on what we are hearing. Yes, we can provide that. Great, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, are there um, additional questions or comments? Madam Chair, I'm, I'm, my hand's up. Well, um, thank you. I need glasses. Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I just want to make sure that I heard you right, Janet. Sure. Um, you're paying for food from the food bank? No, I don't believe I said that. We're... I thought you said you couldn't afford the cost of meals the, to, to get the food for the meals. Um, it. We are... Um, the, the uh, CRF funds have certainly been of help to us, but our demands for providing the meals, we are continuing to provide the meals. There's bigger demands for it, and we're concerned about sustaining those, the funds to be able to keep up with the demand. Okay, so do you deal with the food bank? The food bank is a partner of the AAAs, but we're not taking any money from them, if that's what you were. No, no, it's your food, the food to make the oh, meals. Yes, there's, yes, that's, we're partners with them and our meal sites might be getting some food from uh, food banks or assisting individuals to be aware of the availability of food at food banks. Okay, the, the other question I had is you said there was waiting lists among the home health agencies. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Sure. Thank you. And Molly. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Molly Dugan and um, I, sorry, I just wanna get my testimony here. Um, I work for Cathedral Square and um, I know there's new members on the committee. So I'm really happy to be here today to um, see all members and especially provide some information about Cathedral Square and the SASH program. Um, Cathedral Square is a not-for-profit uh, provider of affordable housing and services, primarily in Northwest Vermont, um, but we do um, provide consulting services and some development assistance across the state. Um, and Cathedral Square has been the administrator of the statewide SASH program since its inception. And SASH stands for Support and Services at Home. Um, until just a few weeks ago, I was the director of the SASH program um, since its inception in 2011. I recently took a new position within Cathedral Square um, as director of policy. Um, so I well, will continue to work on just kind of um, larger issues around SASH and affordable housing. My um, brief comments today are gonna to focus on the SASH response to COVID-19. Um, and SASH um, utilizes the network of affordable housing providers across the state, including all the public housing authorities 
in partnership with health and community provider organizations such as the area agencies on aging, home health agencies, the community mental health um, agencies to help uh, coordinate healthcare and provide support to um, help approximately 5,000 um, older Vermonters and uh, uh, Vermonters with disabilities stay at home throughout their lives. So when you think about kind of the continuum of support in long-term care, the SASH model is really focusing on the uh, pre, you know, trying to keep people in their communities, preventing the premature movement to higher levels, uh, higher level facilities, higher levels of care. Um, I just also wanna make mention that the SASH program is funded through the all payer model, the, um, the healthcare kind of transformation program that the state of Vermont entered into an agreement with the federal government on um, a number of years ago, we're in like year three of the, of the five year um, contract. And the funding comes to us from One Care Vermont. And we are, so, so the, the funding that we get is not fee-for-service dollars. It's a um, value-based payment for the staff that support a population of participants in the SASH program. So I, I just wanted to make mention of that because there's been a lot of um, discussion about, um, you know, just the challenges around fee-for-service. So I wanted to make that clear. Um, I did include in uh, materials that I, that I sent over this morning, a map that shows where the SASH programs are throughout the state. Um, and so pretty much we're in every county because um, there are you know, 140 different affordable housing communities throughout the state that operate the SASH program. And we serve not only the low-income Vermonters that live in those affordable housing communities, but Medicare recipients that live out in the community as well. Molly, um, Molly would you like us to, uh, would you like Julie to put that map up or put any of your material up or how would um, you? I think if, if that would be helpful for people to put the map up, that would be great. If I, Julie, is that something that, well, you're, um, that might be helpful? And while she's doing that, um, you, you mentioned that you get paid, uh, that, that it is fun, that SASH is funded through One Care. Right. Um, my understanding is. Um, SASH is also funded by direct appropriations yes. from the state so that One Care is not um, uh, It's it, not the sole funder. It's, it's not, not the sole funder. And so the, <laughs> yes. um, the, um, the they're, they're not holding the, the total risk themselves. Correct. Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you for that there. It's... Um, our, our staff on the ground, the, the care coordinators and the wellness nurses are paid for from One Care. It's the, it's the SASH administrative structure and partner payments for team meetings that actually is paid through the Dale budget. And, um, and, and so, yes, and, and, and actually I'm gonna be talking more about that in my comments, but um, I see the map has come up. So um, especially for the new members on the committee, hopefully, you know, when you look at your areas of the state, you'll recognize um, some of the housing, affordable housing communities in your area um, and, and they're, that, that operate the SASH program. So again, they serve people living in their congregate buildings as well as um, older Vermonters uh, living in single family homes or mobile homes or private apartments. So as you can tell, it's you know, all those stars, those yellow stars are um, individual housing communities um, that are supported by the SASH staff and the team of providers as well. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm probably gonna make the understatement of the year here, but um, it's been an extremely challenging time um, since early March um, for the SASH program. The um, foundational, I guess I'll call it the foundational strength and value add of the SASH program is the everyday presence and in-person contact that our care coordinators and our wellness nurses have with their participants by being embedded 
in those affordable housing settings across the state, those gold stars that you saw. Um, and this type of presence had to stop abruptly um, early last spring. Um, and that was a, um, you know, that, that was a big deal. Um, and I, I'm, hap I, I'm here, however, um, to be able to share with you that, um, you know, the investment that the legislature has made over the years in the statewide infrastructure for SASH, which is what Madam Chair was referring to just a moment ago, that um, comes from a appropriation uh, from the General Assembly through Dale, um, really allowed us to provide a swift, thorough, consistent, and, and most importantly, compassionate uh, response to help um, keep thousands of older Vermonters and adults with disabilities living in your communities. Um, again, we serve roughly 5,000 um, older Vermonters and adults with disabilities. Um, we were able um, to do this and, and, and really pivot very quickly, um, even though we had to pull staff out of the buildings um, initially, we did this in a number of different ways. Um, because we have this centralized administrative structure for SASH that's housed at Cathedral Square, and then we have this decentralized delivery system of the actual services on the ground through um, you know, it's 22 different affordable housing providers, we were able to really develop and deploy a resource, resource and information section um, on our staff intranet um, that uh, we were able to update for our staff, um, you know, the latest guidance and tools and resources that were coming directly from CDC, the Vermont Department of Health and Dale. Um, and so what that meant was that, you know, our SASH staff up in Island Pond, um, and our SASH staff in Burlington and Bennington and, and St. Albans were all able to access in real time the same information um, and latest guidance, um, which really allowed for a much more consistent uh, response to the questions and challenges that, that were presented in early, early last spring. Um, right away, we um, you know, asked our, our staff to be in contact with their SASH participants by phone um, at least once a week. Um, and they were not, not just to you know, touch base them by phone, but we actually developed um, an individualized COVID-19 questionnaire that they went through with every participant. There was an action plan um, that they developed. And what we learned from this process, where in a standardized process, was that um, the most pressing needs of our SASH participants across the state were um, medication refills, access to food and health care, um, as well as social isolation, which you've heard now from, I think, every single um, witness today, the, um, the real challenges with social isolation. So it was really important that we were able to get that consistent um, feedback around the state on what the most pressing needs were. And that way we could then um, really focus our efforts on helping get those needs met. Um, through the SASH program, we have um, a, it's a collaborative approach, as I mentioned, with our valued community partners, such as the AAAs and Home Health. And we, every SASH program across the state has an identified SASH team that meets on a monthly basis. Um, and has been doing so you know, since the program started. So when the pandemic hit and we had to you know, go remote, um, there were already these really strong and well-established interagency relationships and, and a meeting structure in place um, that was able to continue pretty much seamlessly. I mean, they would normally meet in person at the housing site, um, but now these teams were meeting either by phone or through Zoom. And importantly, you know, able to just continue the conversations and the action planning with their um, shared clients. So uh, really important during that uh, especially difficult time in the spring. Um, another thing that we were able to do through our centralized administrative structure um, was use our uh, single data management system. So all of our SASH staff across the state gather regular information from our participants. Um, our wellness nurses collect health um, information. We were able to develop reports for all of our SASH staff that indicated 
those participants in their, on their panel that were at highest risk for COVID-related complications due to pre-existing conditions. Um, and then staff were then um, able to kind of quickly prioritize outreach and collaboration with their partners. So being able to really use that data and analyze it and shoot it back out to SASH staff in all parts of the state um, was extremely valuable. Um, I wanna just move on to kind of some of our recent um, initiatives and it, which re are really responding to the challenges and the obstacles that we're seeing. Um, I would um, want to think there's been a lot of talk today about, you know, telehealth and telemedicine. And um, that's something that we saw pretty much immediately. Um, our, our wellness nurses, when they would be reaching out by phone early on with their participants, they were hearing very consistently that um, their participants were very fearful of leaving their homes at all. Um, and that included going to see their healthcare providers, um, even when they had um, really important reasons to be seeing their healthcare providers. Um, and that's something that our wellness nurses especially um, spent a lot of time doing uh, with their participants was connecting them with um, their providers. So one of the things that we realized right away is that we needed to work on getting, making sure our participants had access to the technology um, that would allow for the telehealth visits that, you know, were, were burgeoning all over the state. And we did not want our participants to be left out of that because they are lower income and, um, you know, maybe in more rural parts of the state, you know, it's a real health e equity issue. Um, we were able to obtain actually 270 Apple iPads from the Vermont Program for uh, Quality and Healthcare, VPQHC, uh, just in November, a couple months ago. Um, and these um, are allowing us to create uh, lending libraries of these iPads in all of our SASH programs across the state. Um, and I actually included in your packet a flyer um, about, this, about this program. Um, and I don't know if that's something that can be pulled up, um, but it just gives a little bit, it's kind of you know, easy on the eye and gives a little more um, explanation of the program. Um, but what's important is we're not only gonna be setting up these um, lending libraries where participants can have access to these iPads, but we've also realized that you can't just um, send out iPads. You have to um, make sure your staff is trained in how to use them, how to teach um, the participants how to use them. Um, and so we're doing a major um, training that's actually starting in a few weeks with our staff. And we've had to develop lots of policies and protocols, but we wanna make sure that um, not only are the iPads um, there on site, but that our participants um, feel confident in how to use them and our staff will be able to um, be there and support them through a telehealth visit. Um, so that's been an exciting um, development for us. So um, Molly, yeah. this is Ann. Um, I love the fact that you are directing us to what you gave us in the packet. So in, <clears throat> as this is really only week two of the legislative session, we may, um, we need to be reminded to, um, as we look at the agenda, um, um, to uh, whether it's during testimony or whether it is um, after we have heard, um, to go back and to look at everything that people um, have given us. And I'm sort of intersecting right now. I'm hoping that you'd be able to um, wrap up in five minutes so that as a committee we can um, finish up in terms of um, where we go from here. Absolutely. Things like that. Yeah, Thank just, you. yeah, absolutely. Just a few more minutes for <laughs> sure. Um, so uh, the, the other uh, recent initiative based on what we're seeing as obstacles and barriers for our participants is a real focus on social isolation and loneliness um, that has really become, um, you know, really our most pressing challenge as this pandemic has, you know, worsened and we've had to reinstate <laughs> Um, some restrictions that we'd loosened up in the summer months that had allowed for more um, informal, you know, gatherings outside. It, everything is really ratcheted down again. Um, so we're doing a real in-depth training with all of our SASH staff in early February. 
um, and really working on um, helping our staff to do more and more of their programming virtually and via the phone. So really making a lot of um, progress there. Um, food distribution is another thing. Um, SASH uh, has a formalized partnership with the Vermont Food Bank um, for what's called the Direct Distribution Program. And um, food is provided at many of our SASH sites by the Vermont Food Bank um, across the state and our SASH staff help coordinate the delivery and, and outreach. They're trained in safe food practices. They do a lot of programming now um, via Zoom on how to um, prepare uh, meals with the food that's provided. Um, so we are gonna um, continue um, to, to utilize that partnership and it's the, the number of participants um, accessing food has, has grown tremendously as um, Janet was saying with Meals on Wheels as well. Um, and then lastly, um, vaccination sites. We're starting to um, work with local pharmacies and um, to start having COVID-19 vaccinations. I can report that just yesterday, our SASH panel in Bradford um, had a very successful vaccine clinic for their SASH participants there. And that was in collaboration with um, the local Walgreens. So um, we're working on that right now as well. So that's all for me. I'm happy to take any questions and I just really appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, um, thank, um, excuse, excuse me, I apologize. No problem. Um, thank you for your flexibility in terms of timing um, as well as Janet and Sue and Gail. Um, this has been, I think, very, very helpful um, in setting the stage and um, educating us. Uh, are there any questions right now? This is not your last opportunity to hear from any of these people, but are there any questions right now? Thank you. Again, thank you very much, the four of you. Really appreciate it. Um, thank you very much. Take care. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. As I was listening, committee, as I was listening to them, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, social isolation. Well, you know, if we pass a law, by the time we pass the law, hopefully people, you know, I mean, it's like, what can we do balancing in terms of what can we do um, um, that will help things immediately? Um, and so <clears throat> we've got 15 minutes max because Two of us on committee actually have to be somewhere else at three. Um, uh, in terms of what we have listened to, um, what do we want to, what's important that we hear more about or that we delve into as we think about our work this, um, this session? Madam Chair? Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking uh, we have uh, now 14 minutes left and um, we have um, budget adjustment to deal with next week. And um, I'm just, I'm just, if people have any feedback about their budget assignments, we, okay. might, we might want to hear them. And um, first, okay. All right. So um, thank you. This is why we, this is why we're a team. Um, when you, if you are ruminating on what you heard today and what you want to hear more from um, or what we need to be more in depth, um, please send me an email or a text. Um, and I, I, would, I would encourage people to read the um, report that we got yesterday on um, uh, from the uh, adult abuse um, folks at um, Dale, because that okay. ties in with that, yeah. So there's the adult and <clears throat> and actually the long-term care ombudsman's recommendations um, are helpful as well. Um, so um, with a lot of help um, or input, um, 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 I've created some teams. <laughs> so um, we've, we've created some teams in terms of uh, appropriations and Julie, um, could you send it or actually do you have it on one piece of paper? So we she's could, so she's gonna screen share so we can sort of see it as well. Um, and uh, given, um, so this is sort of how we have, um, 
Um, and by the way, the budget adjustment um, was um, presented. I think I sent it, I sent you all, I hope I did, send to you um, a copy of the budget adjustment. And if I didn't, I'll, it's available on the appropriations website and I'll send it to you later. Um, it's not, it's, um, the, uh, the, the narrative is about one page. Um, and the issues seem to be mostly in terms of moving back and forth. Um, uh, everyone should have the budget assignments in your email. Um, but this is sort of um, read them. Does this make sense? I would like to continue my budget assignment with Teresa if she's well, if she's willing. Um, we have you. We, um, you and Teresa are a team looking at Dale Department of Aging and Correct. Independent Living. Okay, good. So we like to that 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 one's okay. Um, Mary Beth, based on um, the fact that you um, have multiple responsibilities, that um, we would lean on you um, for pinch hitting when we needed something, but that you also would bring um, an eye to BIPOC issues. Does that make sense to you? Are you still here? She I am still here and I'm happy to bring that lens to, to the work that everyone's doing. Thank you. And does that fit with um, sort of your multiple responsibilities to maybe have that eye? And I think you're a member of the, or, or you sometimes follow the social equity caucus. Yes, yes. I'm, very, I'm plugged into the social equity caucus. Yes, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, and um, that doesn't mean that someone else, one can't join you or can't take that on or add stuff, but this is a first guess. Um, so um, DCF Family Services, which would is um, uh, foster care and that kind of thing. Um, we had Dan and um, James, is that okay? Okay with me. Fine with me. Okay. The, um, there's, I don't see anything necessarily right now in the budget adjustment at all, um, but we, we may need to pay attention to this um, in the budget as it relates to um, the, the Family First Prevention Act, and that, which is a federal act and that kind of thing. Um, and then Jessica, we have um, you um, focused you taking um, focused on economic services, um, which is reach up and um, it may also connect with child development if the, if the idea of moving um, CCFAP over there. Um, and we have, um, we have you and Taylor doing that. Sounds um, good. And Taylor, does that um, it, does that is that sort of okay with you, or would you like to be elsewhere? That sounds good to me, Anne. Okay, thanks. And um, uh, we have um, I have then um, then based on um, your other your um, sort of we have you with Topper in terms of OEO um, Office of Economic Opportunity. So you'll be the link between. Um, Economic Services and the Office of Economic Opportunity, which is a little bit of housing, a little bit of other kinds of things, uh, general assistance and that. Um, and uh, Jessica, you and Kelly, you get child development because um, between the two of you around, um, <laughs> no laughing, um, you know, that, oh. <laughs> you know, um, and um, then the Department of Health would be Teresa and um, Dane. Um, that leaves a few things that we might have to figure out as it relates to um, things that people get that we get interested in or connected with. 
Um, for the most part, um, DIVA, Department of Vermont um, Health Access is more within the uh, jurisdiction of the healthcare committee, but there may, you know, there may be monetary money things that are happening in DIVA that would um, impact, for instance, the Department of Health. Um, and I may very well ask for help with um, central office, um, which is where a lot of the grants come out of um, as, and depending upon what is in there um, in terms of that. Uh, so if this work, if this is okay with you all, um, and I will send this to uh, Mary Hooper, um, who will then distribute it to folks. Actually, um, Julie, if you could send that, I think the idea is to send it to um, Mary Hooper along and then copy uh, Kimberly and um, the other two, the other two people. <laughs> um, I'm now forgetting who it is. I know. David Yacobone, a and um, who's who's health department? Peter Fagan. And, and Peter Fagan. Fagan. Yep. He had actually emailed something to Dan and I because we talked to him the previous two years and I forwarded it to Teresa. So he's already all over it. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> what we're um, um, trying to... Um, We'll see how this works. Try, I'm trying to keep all of health department in one. Um, you and Dan last year focused on health department, but primarily um, substance use and that. And um, uh, a whole different focus this year. <laughs> a whole different focus on sort of childcare and education. You get all of that. <laughs> um, those kinds of things. Um, so we will. Um, we were going to have bill introductions on Tuesday afternoon, just so people could um, hear um, from the sponsors, what I call um, their, their brief introductions. Their, what's, the, what's the issue? What's the problem they're trying to address? Why? Um, it's not an opportunity to bring, um, to bring witnesses. It's more their, their opportunity to try to persuade us to make this a priority. Um, but we're not going to, um, the chair of, of appropriations um, wants, to, wants our recommendations by Friday. Um, looking, I did a quick look. Um, it really looks like the on, only question, the big questions have to do with, um, seems like reach up out of economic services, the caseload went down. Not quite sure. So, I mean, there's in terms of the information that we got. Um, so on Tuesday afternoon, we're going to hear testimony um, or presentation of the budget adjustment um, by folks from um, DCF. And uh, then we'll know what the little teams, if any, need to do as it relates to the budget adjustment. Otherwise, it may be nothing until the budget. Mary Beth, you look like you want to say something. No. Okay. I am good. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, it's been a long day. Um, hey, Pip, Pip, Madam Chair. Yes. I, I just went through the budget adjustment. Um, the only thing I see there is $375,000 for something. Um, you, you were talking about reach up and all this other stuff. Was that in the budget adjustment too? Um, I think I've, you know, I was reading it quickly last night, late in the evening. So I might have reread something, but there is the numbers and then there's some, um, and then there's a page of sort of very quick explanations. Yeah. And um, I thought I saw something there. I may, have, this is why I'm not taking that part topper. That's okay. why. That's why we're a team because okay. I mean, all I see is three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars for legal aid. Okay. Well, well. Um, then you may be fine. 
your area may be fine. I just right want to. I, I just don't want to make. I want to make sure, Madam Chair, that I'm looking at the same stuff you are. Um. Well, I can't promise that, Topper. But yeah, we'll try. Okay. Um, but you know, this is. I mean, we'll 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 hear the budget the budget adjustment, and um, we like it when there's nothing in the budget adjustment. When really it really is just the mid-year correction and moving the chess pieces so that it's all covered. Um, and that's really all we're trying to make sure right now. This is a precursor for the budget, which is happening in a couple of weeks. Um, it's no longer a blue sky in my out my window, but it was at lunchtime. Um, uh, so hopefully folks can get um, some time outside and not be socially isolated um, this weekend and Monday. You know, I'm always available by phone or text and I will see you Tuesday morning. Thank you very much for the hard um, work that we all did and see you later. Thank you. Bye.